Is the U.S. housing bubble about to pop? Is the national economy slowing? And with deflation being the biggest risk to the economy, is what happened to Tesla today about to happen to the bond market? Answer those questions and more on today's show. I'm your host, Steve Van Meter, and thanks for joining me today as we get into this housing-related issue because so many people get the housing market wrong. They believe that it's entirely based on interest rates. And if they don't believe that, they now believe that has everything to do with the Fed's balance sheet. They believe as the Fed expands its balance sheet, which we know they're likely to start slowing their expansion, which we'll find out here in a couple of weeks, that somehow asset prices and home prices magically rise. And that even when the Fed, should it actually complete its taper, it will still be expanding its balance sheet, meaning that real estate has to be one of the safest places to invest. But is that actually true? Or are there a lot of cracks in the foundation that are starting to show that this bubble is just moments away from bursting? Well, let's start out by looking at foreclosures. So here we see that foreclosures are surging now that COVID mortgage bailouts are ending. So you, this is a big story here now, but they're still at very low levels. And I want you to see this because mortgage lenders began the foreclosure process on over 25,000 properties in the third quarter. Now this is, well, it's not a ton and it isn't, but it is a 32% increase from the second quarter. And on a year over year basis, it's a whopping 67% increase from the third quarter of 2020, according to uh, Adam and mortgage data firm. But the story doesn't end there because what is the issue here? It's well, it's this forbearance story and government private sector relief programs allow borrowers with financial difficulties to delay their monthly payments for up to 18 months the missed payments could then be tacked on to the end of their loan period or repaid when the home was sold or the mortgage is refinanced now i want you to keep in mind that you look at what the story i mean you can start to see how this is going to go wrong all these all these people who didn't have to make their payments well all those payments are going to shuttle to the end and if there is a contraction in housing prices what is going to happen to them now they're going to get upside down or hey, it's okay you can pay us when you sell well what's going to happen when they're upside down and then they have to reach into their pocket and make up the difference with money they don't have. And so you can start to see how this is becoming an issue. And if you look at the states where the largest number of foreclosures, it's no surprise California would be leading. You've got Texas, Florida, New York, and Illinois. And why do these five states matter? Because home prices in these states tend to be higher than most other states. And that's where you're likely going to see an increase in foreclosures. But the Fed, in their infinite wisdom, published this article recently on Liberty Street Economics. And I know this is just completely obvious, but if prices fall, mortgage foreclosures will rise. That's right. Fed being captain obvious here. And check this out. Well, what if prices fall? In order to fully understand the riskiness of this stock of debt, we go one step further by calculating the expected delinquency transitions under various adverse price scenarios. So the Fed said, hey, we'll figure out how bad this could get. And they have determined that there's either if prices fell to where they were two years ago or four years ago. And what they find is that housing prices would fall somewhere around 12% if we're going back two years ago and around 20% if we go back four years ago with Idaho leading what they estimate would be a decline. Now you kind of wonder what's the story with Idaho. Well, it just so happens a lot of Californians, and I mean a lot of Californians when they retire are leaving and going to Idaho and they're taking their, their equity and just driving prices up there. So those in Idaho are benefiting, but according to the Fed, they also are at the biggest risk if that trend stops. But the Fed doesn't give up on their story here. What can they say about how mortgage performance would evolve under these scenarios? Well, you can only imagine. To start with, the price declines would drive many borrowers into negative equity. Shocking. Putting them at risk for default. Because of strong price growth since 2016, we estimate that Idaho, Utah, Nevada, and Arizona would all experience negative equity rates of more than 30% if prices retraced to where they were four years ago. And not really surprised if that did happen, that people would actually go and do delinquency and then to default. 
But the Fed says there's one caveat to this fairly benign scenario. So they don't think that any of this is possible. Mortgage forbearances, as noted as above, our default estimates exclude. So they're not even counting the loans already in forbearance, which represent about 2.7% of loans in, as of June 2020, because widespread forbearance is a new approach to avoiding default and foreclosure. No kidding, right? Hey, if nobody has to make their payments on their debt, they can't default. Absolutely brilliant thinking by the Fed here that when you see they don't know what's going to happen when these programs in. Do you want to take a guess of what's actually going to happen? Is there going to be some people who can't afford their payments and the Fed will probably be shocked by this? But let's see what they have to say. Some share they will be likely be able to resume making payments while others may have to sell their homes. And this is great. Given the strong price growth and very tight for sales tight for sale inventory of housing. These borrowers will generally have positive equity if they have to sell, enabling them to pay off their loans and avoid default. So according to the Fed, this is great because prices have gone up so much that if you can't afford your home, you can just sell it and you'll get out of all of that debt. Now you'll be homeless, but hey, at least you'll get out from under that debt. So the Fed sees this as not really a big deal. But it is. It's not just a foreclosure story, my friends. We then have to talk about what's going on with Zillow because Zillow tumbles after it stops buying new homes. And this comes back from last week, though their stock fell as much as 6.8% in pre-market trading last Monday to clear its backlog of properties. Now, if you didn't know what's going on with Zillow, now they have a ton of information on properties. And with all this information, they thought, how can we make more money than we're making now and what did they decide to do? They went to the banks and used the power of their corporate borrowing ability to get ultra mega low, super low rates. And they decided to get into the home flipping business because they have all the data. So what they did is they went out and looked for homes that were for sale listed on their platform that needed a little bit of work. And they bought them with the idea that they bring in contractors, you know, spruce up the property and turn around and flip it for, as you can guess, a profit. Now, if you've ever flipped real estate or been in the real estate market, you know there's some issues with this and flipping property is there are carrying costs. Now, we'll assume that Zillow didn't actually take out a mortgage on each property, which they wouldn't have. But what are some of the issues they face? Well, you face property taxes, maybe HOA fees. You've got maintenance. You, you, you can't just let a home sit empty and turn off all electricity if you're trying to show it. Not to mention that every one of the properties they bought needed some work. So you have to bring in contractors and then you have to manage that process and make sure the work gets done. You want to make money in flipping, got to get in and got to get out and you can't sit on it. Well, look what happened from some of the, uh, my fans on Twitter who were posting some images recently. Here's a property that sold to Zillow 545,000 and now it's down to 500,000. And you say, well, it's not a big loss. Well, if you start compounding that with a lot of properties, it's a huge issue because remember, Zillow's also got to make the interest payments on the money it borrowed originally. And here you see this home here sold to Zillow 441.6 thousand and currently listed at 435,000. So huge problem. And what did that react to Zillow stock? Well, it took a toast dive, but the investors have since decided that a week later, well, that's not really an issue, but in terms of, of Zillow, Zillow's overall stock picture, well, it doesn't look pretty. In fact, usually when you see patterns like this, you get some sort of a rebound before the world realizes that this stock is not good because now they're gonna not only just sit on debt that they're gonna have to make payments on, they've got properties they're going to need to unload. And the more supply that starts entering the market, what happens to prices if borrowers go away? Of course, that is the question is, will there be borrowers or buyers out there? Well, we have to look here at the purchase application data in white and what do we find that it leaves existing home sales. So based on where we're starting to see the trend of mortgage applications suggests that we're not going to see a big boom in housing. But what about the original story of this correlation between interest rates and the Fed balance sheet? What's really driving housing prices? because it's not what it's, you think. And so let me show you. Here we've got the median sales prices of homes sold in the United States in blue, and you can see it goes up and during recessions, shaded in gray, well, they go down and they go down a little bit in this last one and then they shot higher. So I've got overlaid 30 year treasury yields. I could have used uh, mortgage rates, but there's not a big difference in those. 
And what we should see is if this relationship is true that lower interest rates cause housing prices to only go higher, well, that's not exactly true because here you can see coming back to the 2000s recession, the rates went up a little bit and then they went down at the same time home prices went down. And here you can see kind of in 2007, rates in red started to roll down. And guess what? Home prices went down. But everyone says home prices only go up when rates go lower. Well, not always the case because I want you to be thinking that falling rates tend to mean tightening financial conditions. And here you can see uh, that interest rates were static. They didn't rise or really fall and prices didn't move much. And then rates started falling, falling, falling. It wasn't until after the rates went down, the prices went up. So it's not really a story of if just interest rates go lower and I'm protected in my equity. How about we look at the Fed's monetary base? This is when the Fed does its quantitative easing, it expands what is referred to as its balance sheet, which is part calculated as the monetary base. And what you can see is everyone likes to draw the correlation at the starting point, but really there was no relationship prior. And I could zoom this out and show you, but there's really no point because what happened by the end of QE3, and we get into a bit of a balance sheet taper here, housing prices don't fall. So if there was a relationship to the Fed's balance sheet and housing prices, then housing prices should have come down quite a bit, and they didn't. In fact, when the Fed shot its balance sheet up, housing prices didn't react right away until afterwards. So not much a relationship there. So what really is driving the housing market? Well, what if I told you it had a lot to do with energy. So let's take a look at this. I've got crude oil, uh, West Texas Intermediate out of Cushing, Oklahoma overlaid here. And what I want you to see is going back into the uh, early 90s recession, crude oil shot up and housing prices started to come down. And then you see crude oil prices rising here going into the next recession. And then all of a sudden as crude oil breaks, there goes housing prices. Here you can see crude oil shooting up going into the great financial crisis. That almost at the same time as crude bottoms and goes up, housing prices peak and go lower. And then you start to see crude and housing prices rise together. And the reason housing prices continued is because energy prices fell. Now, if you're trying to figure this out, one of the key things to an expanding economy is you need cheap energy. And if you have cheap energy, then all of a sudden you can get a lot of economic growth. But when energy prices get too high, what happens? Well, to consumers' balance sheets, well, it means less discretionary spending. If they have less money to spend, that flows through the economy and eventually leads to a slowing. So that's why when you start to see energy prices get too high, you start to see some negative outcomes. So let's start looking over here. Energy prices then come back up into the 70s a barrel. And what happens? Housing prices start to slow and they start to kind of try to move back as energy prices fall, but they still remain too high. Energy prices tank and all of a sudden together they both start to rise. And now with crude over 80 a barrel, is it starting to suggest that the housing bubble is likely to pop? Well, if it does, and we should also see signs of the economy slowing down here too. And to that, we go look at the Chicago Fed National Activity Index, which is really one of the best indicators of what's going on in the national economy. And this month it contracted. So what the way you read this is at zero, when it is at zero, and the month before it was at 0 0.05, so just slight increase, a zero is average at trend growth for the economy. So what you would wanna see is what you see here is some above trend, a little bit below, some above, some below. I mean, it's just kind of going along and you wanna see it maybe just above zero. When I mean above zero, you're gonna see a 0, 0.0 something. And it could be slightly negative, but now what do we see in September? a drop, the, the CFNAI drops to minus 0 0.13. You see production and income drown minus 0 0.37. Employment, unemployment, and hours worked, which we know hours worked are up and employment's been up a bit at 0 0.16. Personal consumption, what drives the economy? 0 0.02, so at trend growth. How about sales, orders, inventory? 0 0.07, at trend growth. So what we're seeing from the Chicago Fed this economy is contracting. That does not bode well for the housing market because as everything slows down, it transmits through the economy and that will have an effect on housing prices. But how does that turn into the bond market? Because the biggest risk to the, to the economy is outright deflation 
And what happened with Tesla today, could that actually happen to the bond market? Now, if you're not familiar with what happened to Tesla, there was a massive short squeeze. And let me show you kind of what that story looked like. The Tesla hits a trillion market cap for the first time after Hertz, says it will buy 100,000 electric vehicles. Now, I want you to keep in mind that Tesla is such a big auto manufacturer by market cap, it's bigger than the nine following companies combined. So Tesla hits a trillion dollars after uh, Hertz said it was going to buy 100,000 EVs, stock jumps, and causes a massive short squeeze. And what does that look like? Well, you could see Tesla stock here going just parabolic today because there was a lot and lot of shorts on this stock. Now, I'm not going to go through all that because I'm sure there'll be plenty of other channels that cover this in more detail, but I want to show you how the same event is going to end up in an outright deflationary move and bond prices are probably going parabolic like you see here with Tesla. Now, let's start here with a slide that I posted on uh, Twitter this weekend where you see cash assets and you see there's a minus sign there inverted. So they're inverted cash at all commercial banks. Now, keep in mind when cash builds up, again, it's showing inverted, so it's gonna fall, that puts downward pressure on interest rates. And I've got 30 year yields overlaid here, and you can see as cash rises, interest rates go down. And when interest rates rise and it's falling against rising cash positions, interest rates fall. And then you can see financial conditions tightened up in late 2018, rates started to fall, and cash positions again rose through the pandemic. And they're still rising, suggesting that all these people that are short the bond market are going to find themselves on the wrong side of the trade. Now, this continues here. We looked at this chart, but I've got an update for you on the most pessimistic outlook for bonds in the history of fund manager survey of a net percentage of investors say they are overweight. So you see there are a ton of fund managers that say, hey, uh, we're, we're bearish on bonds. But you know, fund managers tend on these surveys not to disclose their actual position, but what they're thinking. So the question is, were they lying on the survey or not? Well, survey says they were being truthful. So if so, here's a survey that came out by Deutsche Bank that says the return-based indicators show portfolio managers are bearish on duration, that in fact, they are actually short the bond market in a big way and that they're matching what they're seeing in the surveys. And we see that asset managers, net position treasury futures collapsed uh, by a fifth since September. So they were dumping and getting out of their treasury positions. And so this comes from our buddy, Travis Kimmel, as you know, president of Real Vision, the bear lord himself. And he overlaid TLT on a weekly chart. And I know this is hard to see, but I'm gonna map this out that you can see the TLT bottoms here in um, early 2007. And then after fund managers get super bearish on it, it goes straight vertical. And then in February, 2011, TLT is bottoming, fund managers are bearish, it goes vertical. You see it again, September in 2013, TLT is bottoming. Everyone thinks it's gonna collapse. Fund managers are bearish. It goes vertical. And in 2018, finally, fund managers get it right. They're bearish. Bond prices go down and then it just moonshot straight higher. And here we are again, the most bearish position for fund managers. And when what I want you to understand is when everyone's betting on one side of the market, guess what happens to price? It goes the opposite because then you get a massive short squeeze, much like what happened with Tesla. But is that true for TLT? Well, here you can see TLT shorts aggressively add to positions. This is from Hedgeopia. You're seeing massive high short positions on TLT, almost 40% of it sold short. So what you're seeing is the risk to the economy now is deflation. You get start getting some deflationary prints in the news. You have all these bets on the wrong side of the market. They're going to go shifting and you're going to see bond prices do something that they haven't done since March 2020. And that is go straight up. Now with that, let's wrap this story with the H.8 report from last week. We see bank credit expanding. But how about this for all those bond bears out there that are watching, well, we see the non-mortgage-backed securities rose by $27 billion uh, at, by commercial banks. So they're out buying bonds when everyone else is eagerly selling them. How about that? The banks know what's coming. Loans and leases, all commercial banks were up. That demand was strongly led by real estate 
Uh, commercial industrial loans were also, they were flat. How about consumer loans? Consumers still driving about $8 billion. And those cash assets, well, they were down just a little bit. But overall, they're trending higher. Let's take a look at the consolidated report here that I've got for you. And we can see that real estate loans are moving higher, which is a good indication. 30-year uh, fixed rate mortgages, last time that we saw this get up here we saw it start to peak out as everyone refied so we'll be curious to see now if we see this trend change so the 12 month rate change is 1.26 percent in rising six month almost a two three month rate change is at 1.3 in rising so overall good trends but we've seen how higher yields eventually get rejected and we'll be interested to see if that happens again how about commercial industrial loans 12 month rate change is at minus 10 and rising six month rate change minus five and rising three month rate change minus one and a half and rising but still negative overall with no signs of velocity again behind it total loans and leases though now the 12 month rate change is just shy of one percent six month rate change is one and a half and rising three month at one plus and rising and mainly due to the housing market and consumer loans credit card look at this 12 month rate change at four percent and rising some of the data behind that suggests that the reason you're seeing these credit card uh, numbers rise because consumers are tapped out of money. We'll talk about that in a future show. In the meantime, thanks for being fans. Thanks for liking. Thanks for subscribing. If it wasn't for you, we couldn't be here. And with that, I'll see you back on Wednesday. I'm Steve Van Meter. Thanks for watching. Bye now. The content of this video is private educational information is not intended by investors or the rights to show not to be construed as recognition or solicitation by our state security fans with instrument or participate in a particular training strategy. This video was prepared by Steam Van Meter on personal capacity, opinions expressed in the video and that are my own do not affect the view of Atlas Financial Advice Inc. or Steam Van Meter Financial.